like it when they feel sick. Anyone? How many people like to feel weak or injured? Nobody? Well, of course not, right? We don't ever want to be down and out. We'd much rather be going. We'd much rather be strong physically. And of course, even more important is that we're strong spiritually. And so the topic for today is going to be strengthening the weak. Because unfortunately, there's always people out there that are weak spiritually. And if we're not careful, their weakness can weaken us. But what should happen, though, is our strength should help to strengthen them. So first, we're going to focus on us being strong spiritually. There was a point where Jesus told Peter, once you were converted, strengthen your brethren. And Peter didn't get it because Peter thought he was strong, but Peter wasn't strong at that point because he denied Jesus later that night. So we want to make sure, first of all, that we're strong and then focus on how to strengthen others. But for a passage just to get us going, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7. I'm sure you guys are all like me in the sense that if you had a choice, you would be strong in every way. You wouldn't be in any way sick or weakened or injured. You would have everything just going on perfect, physically speaking, and emotionally and spiritually in your lives. But as we're going to see from this passage, it's not always God's will for our lives to be like that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. Paul is writing here about all these great things that he saw, but this happened in response to those things. Paul says, And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. So we don't know what this thorn in the flesh is, and people try to make guesses, but we don't really know. It was something, though, that was bothering him, that in some way weakened him, that he wanted to get rid of. And so he did what any good Christian should do. Verse 8, it says, Consider, Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So he prayed, and he prayed more than once. You know, God, if it's your will, get me better. But apparently it was so important for him to receive this lesson that Jesus wanted to do that he spoke to him. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Not my favorite verse in the Bible, but it's true because it's the word of God, and God is truth. So we need to realize that God's power, the way that he works, is different. Now I know there's so many times in my own life that I prayed harder when I had a weakness of some kind, when I was struggling with something. There are times that it may be renewed or encouraged again to be stronger spiritually. And so God tells us what we maybe already know from our experience, that you know what, this weakness can actually strengthen us spiritually. And so he says, most gladly therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So it's one of those things that seems like a paradox. I remember there was one point in my life when I was living in Berkeley that I used to lift weights all the time. And because I had a friend that was much bigger than me and he used to lift lots of weights. And I was sore basically every single day. And you know what? I wanted to just be happy about being in shape without the difficulty of being sore, right? And it doesn't work like that. When we're growing stronger spiritually, there are going to be things that are going to weaken us. That are going to, we might feel slow us down or cause us pain in life. But you know what? That's just the process of the way that things go. It would be great if we could exercise and get in great shape without any sort of difficulty. We could run for five miles and not sweat or not get tired. But we know it doesn't work that way. So what Paul says is, you know what? I'm okay with all these things that are making me weak emotionally and that I struggle with spiritually. I'm not saying I love this, but it's true because it's God's word. So we have to realize when the trials of life come our way, that these things we shouldn't let to weaken us to the point where we're not following Jesus. Because he says something interesting at the end of verse 10. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So sometimes we need the problems that, that come our way because they give us spiritual strength. Now we can't use those as excuses, of course. I mean, things happen, more tragic things happen that slow us down more than others. The Bible says there's a time and a season for everything under heaven. So there's a time to rejoice, there's a time to weep. There's times for everything. 
But these things ought to always, in a general sense, be drawing us to be stronger and closer to God. So we're going to look at another passage where we have some control on whether we're weak or not in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 27. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 27. So speaking of the Lord's Supper here, it's saying that there was a worthy manner and an unworthy manner to take it. There's two main theories. One is that they were doing it and taking other food so they weren't giving God his due glory. But what seems from the context in this moment is that we have to be right with God to take the Lord's Supper. Now praise God because he's merciful. We can even pray if we question we haven't really been walking right. Ask God's forgiveness even right before we're going to take it. So it's going to show here about what we need to do in examining ourselves. Verse 27, the Bible says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So there's times in life that we have to examine ourselves. There are certain sins and things in life that would be obvious to us. Think about it physically. If I was to break my arm and my bone was coming out of my arm, there would be no doubt in my mind I needed help, right? I wouldn't have to think real hard, oh, maybe I should go to a doctor. But there's times in life with the spiritual struggles that we have that if we're not examining ourselves, we not, might not be aware of those things. There's times that we might be doing things like, for example, when I used to run all the time, I used to do this thing where I would flop my feet when I was running downhill. And my coach told me one day, he said, don't do it because it's going to hurt your knees when you get older. Do you know what I did? I kept running, flopping my feet. Do you know what happened when I was almost 30 years old and tried to start running again? My knees started hurting. And because I passed up this perfectly good advice for my coach, I suffered for it. God's giving us advice or commands, if you will, through his word. So he's telling us to examine ourselves. When we're doing something that's not the best technique because it's against God's will, we've got to examine ourselves, not just to take the Lord's Supper, but really every day we ought to examine ourselves. If we go out of the house and we just look in like a mess and, you know, our shirt's backwards and everything, you know, we would want to make sure we looked a little bit better before we went out, right? So spiritually, we have to make the same self-examination every day. It says in verse 29, For he who eats and drinks, eats and eats judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. So this is more than likely talking about weakness and sickness and sleep spiritually. People that are not where they need to be. And if you're not right with God spiritually, it's going to affect you in other areas of your life. Have you ever said something to someone that you wish you didn't say, but you know it's just because you were having a bad day or weren't in the best mood or took what they said the wrong way? I mean, I've done that more times than I can count. And so we need to realize that it's this continual thing of examining ourselves and making sure we're right before God. Because we don't always realize our spiritual weakness. And we're not examining ourselves, we might miss out on things. Because in a general sense, Paul talked about, you know, as we're going to read later, that he is strong and bear the infirmities of the weak. But we all suffer with spiritual weakness at some point or another. That's why it's important because these things kind of creep up on us. There are certain diseases and infirmities that we don't always know right away when we're getting them. So we want to be aware of these things so we can catch them early. The same is true with our spiritual life. We have to be examining ourselves and very alert. There's a passage in Mark 14 where Jesus says to watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I don't know if you guys feel that internal struggle, but I know that I notice it in my life that sometimes I want to do the right thing, but sometimes I'm like, oh man, I don't really feel like doing that, or I don't feel like talking to this person, or you know, doing whatever it is that I know God wants me to do, but I sometimes let that weakness overtake the will of God. So that's why I'm saying to watch and pray. Be aware of these things and pray like Paul did. He saw the weakness, he prayed for it, but yet God decided not to take it away. But most of the time, most of these weaknesses, especially with something self-inflicted or inflicted by the sin of others, God is willing to take away. And we should praise Him for that. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. Hebrews 12 and 11. This talks about when we receive correction from the Word of God. This isn't my favorite verse either, but once again, it's in the Bible and it's good for us, as we're going to see at the end of the verse. It says, all discipline, for the moment, 
seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I mean, who really likes to get corrected and told what they're doing is wrong, right? But the Bible tells us a lot of things what we need to do. And sometimes God uses people to bring in our remembrance what the Word of God is saying, or even to teach us something we might not have even known before. So it's saying whatever the discipline is, no one likes to hear you're not doing good enough. It says that it's grievous at the moment. But afterwards, to those who have been trained by it, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now, you know what I learned from flopping my feet running down and then my knees hurting? I don't have to worry about because there's no hills here. But don't do it. Change, right? Stop flopping your feet, spiritually speaking. Stop doing these things that we know are only hurting us in the end. So if we're trained and take the wisdom that's from God and apply it, it says in the end it's going to yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. That our lives will truly be better receiving the word of God. And so it's going to tell us what to do to straighten things out. Verse 12, it says, Therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. So this is also paralleling between the physical and the spiritual. And my wife at her job probably deals with this all the time. That if you have a problem, like for example, I had a friend of mine that he had a stroke. And he wasn't able to use his right leg very well. So what he would do is he kind of drag his leg behind him when he would walk. But when he exercised, he wouldn't drag his leg as much and he would be able to pick it up. And his whole body was doing better. Everything was doing better when he worked on walking straight. The same is true for us spiritually. When we walk straight, it's going to help us in every way. If you keep dragging this leg... It's going to hurt eventually other parts of your body that are compensating to try to pull this leg along. The same you could argue is even true in a whole sense for the body of Christ. If we got people that are not walking with Jesus, it's going to hurt us in the long run. So we have to help those people to be strengthened to walk in the way. Like uh, the other day my feet were hurting, but I didn't want to not go out and exercise, right? So I had to focus on, because I knew this verse that I was going to talk about it, I had to focus on keep my legs straight. Because it might have felt better to not do anything. It might have felt better to compensate for the parts of my foot that was hurting. But I knew that overall that wasn't what was best. That through the strengthening of doing God's will, we're going to get stronger. And when we put off what we know we need to do, we put off the physical exercise, we're never going to get stronger. We put off the spiritual work of God, we're not going to be able to help the weak because we're going to be too weak ourselves to lift people up out of the problems that they're dealing with. So we are strong, hopefully, if we're doing what God wants us to. So we're going to have to look at how to help those that are weak. And at the end with that, we're going to be in Romans chapter 14 and verse 1. Romans 14 and 1. This is a good passage because it shows us just because someone has a weakness in a certain area doesn't mean it's always our responsibility for all areas to straighten people out. So this is going to talk about that area that we can just let people go if they have a misunderstanding. Romans 14 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. So there are certain things that are not essential for someone to do, but are beliefs that they might connect to the Bible. And it's going to give the example in verse 2 right here. One man has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. So interesting enough, in California, we deal with millions of people like this. They're called vegetarians. Now, most vegetarians, from what I understand, are not doing it because of their biblical beliefs. They're doing it based on maybe an ethical belief, because they think the animals aren't treated well enough, or they're doing it because they feel like they'll be healthier if they eat it, or whatever their reasons are. They have reasons that they don't eat meat. Now, for us, if we eat meat, we don't have to persuade the vegetarians to convert to our meat-eating ways. We might think they're missing out on a lot in life, we might want to tempt them, if you will, with hamburgers and cheeseburgers and steaks. But you know what? That's okay if they're vegetarians. They don't want to be vegetarians. That's okay. And verse 3 says that they should feel the same way about us. It says, Let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has accepted him. So vegetarians, they're okay. Meat eaters, we're okay. We don't have to pass judgment. 
I mean, we can go to multiple verses in the Bible and even later in this chapter and say it's okay to eat meat. You can eat whatever meat you want. You want to eat duck. You want to eat lamb. You want to eat porcupine. Hey, the world's our oyster or eat meat eating, right? But you know what? It's not for us to push on other people. If they don't believe that, hey, praise God. They can go to heaven being a vegetarian or even a vegan. Praise God. We've got to convert people off of certain things that are not important. So we don't have to nitpick everyone's beliefs. And it's going to show how we adapt to people who are things like vegetarians starting in chapter 15 in verse 1. The next chapter says, Now we who are strong ought to bear with the weaknesses of those without strength and not just to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. So it talks even a little bit earlier too about putting a stumbling block, that we should be careful not to put a stumbling block in our brother or sister's way. So you know what? When we see people that are weak, that have these problems, there's certain things that we don't have to quote unquote fix them for. I know someone that they used to be a meat eater and then they became a vegetarian and then they became a vegan within two years. And they were personally insulted if you ate meat in their presence. So you know what you're supposed to do as a Christian? Not eat meat in their presence. Kind of crazy, right? But 1 Corinthians 8 and 13 backs that up if you question it. So we got to be people that are willing to bear with the infirmities of the weak. We can say, it's our right, if you will, to say, well, that person has an issue and they should get over it. But... The Bible is saying that we are strong. If we believe we're strong in Christ, we need to bear with people's weaknesses. It's not about pleasing ourselves. That whatever we do is to be building them up. Now, of course, this passage in particular could go beyond just the people that are weak. This goes for the people that are spiritually weak because of sin in their life or apathy or whatever it is. That we need to do things to build them up, to strengthen them. And we could say, well, that's their fault, that's their responsibility, but these next two verses will help us with that. Verse 3, it says, For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell upon me. So Jesus, praise God, didn't come to this earth to please himself. He wouldn't have performed probably half the miracles. He wouldn't have spent near as much time with people. He wouldn't have done almost anything he did if all of his life was focused on self-pleasure. So since he is our example to follow in his steps, we need to go out of our way to help the weak, to realize this life is not about pleasing ourselves. I had two different tasks that I thought that I was going to do yesterday for Jesus. Neither task I wanted to do, just honestly speaking. Uh, and these are the tasks ended up working out. But you know what? I had a choice in my life. I had a choice whether I could go to these people that I didn't think wanted help, but I knew they were weak spiritually. I knew they needed correction. I knew that they, in my opinion, believed or were practicing something that could keep them from heaven. So it was my responsibility. And I felt like, oh, woe is me, you know, kind of feeling sorry for myself. The next pastor we're going to talk about will deal with that. But something that I could have done that I definitely plan to do with the first one, but I know I should have planned to do with the second one, is in this next verse right here. It says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So I planned for the first one to sit down and have a Bible study because this individual believed things that I believe was hindering his relationship with his family and with, you know, I think possibly his relationship with God. And so I didn't want to do it because from what everyone in the family told me, this guy believed what he believed. He condemned everyone else. And they were like, can you come over and study and you'll set this guy straight, basically. I was like, Shh, okay. But it turned out he wasn't home when I got there. But once again, are we willing to go and do those things even if they're not what we want to do? And I tend to use the Bible. The other one, I didn't plan to break out the Bible. But you can still minister to someone without slapping open the Bible in their lap and saying, look, sinner. You can still do it in a way to their edification and build them up. And we know the Word of God. We can share it without opening the Bible. And sometimes when you're able to quote Scripture in certain settings, it comes off as less threatening, right? So even if you don't know exactly what the verse says, there's certain things we know when people aren't walking with Jesus. And we need to point to the Bible, not just say, oh, well, if that's what you want to do with your life. We need to point people back to the Word of God to give them strength. Because it says through the encouragement and the perseverance of the scriptures, we might have hope. So God wants us to persevere and through the word we can gain strength and other people can gain strength. And we have to point people like that, knowing that this has the answers. 
and to not give like a Christian light, so to speak, you know, of give them whatever they need. Give them a double portion if they need to a second time to hear it. I'm preaching myself right now. Okay, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14. This is going to talk about there's a little bit of difference depending on the weakness within people. And so we got to deal with people differently based upon the other weaknesses that's going to be discussed here. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14. The Bible says, And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, and curse the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. So that patient with all men is what I was referring to from before. What I struggle with, I guess, sometimes is the patience. Is that I, you know, most of the time I feel I know what God wants me to do. I know that I need to do it, but I don't have enough patience sometimes, I think, to do it with the best heart or the best manner. But it's going to show us that not everyone needs you to, you know, take the Bible and knock them with it, right? The first category seems to, to admonish the unruly. So there's some people that truly, they know the Word of God, and they're just not practicing it. So we're supposed to admonish to correct a little bit stronger for those people that, you know, know what to do, but they're not doing it. The Bible says to him it's sin. So we need to correct those people with a little bit more oomph. Sometimes there's people, as it says here, that are faint-hearted, that they just get easily discouraged. You don't need to slap someone up with the Bible if they're just easily discouraged. It's just to encourage them, to try to build them up. Because there's a lot of people that they face that struggle with the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. With the unruly, in my personal opinion, those unruly people are knowingly sowing to the flesh, and they don't care. They're just, they know what to do, they don't care, it's not this internal struggle. The faint-hearted, it seems like, are people that have a heart, but it's just not very strong. So these people, they need encouragement. They might know, and we can point out scriptures as well for those people, but deal with them with courses that we studied previous in a way to build them up. And it says, in a general sense, to help the weak. So whatever kind of help that they need, Go on and give it. We know if we were weak and we were struggling, that we would want someone to help us. I have a friend of mine, he's a preacher at one of the churches in Madeira, and uh, he said that one time he had, he'd never had back problems his whole life. And he said one day he reached down for something, and his back just went, and he laid for four to five hours just on the ground by himself. Because I guess he had no phone, no nothing with him. I mean, we know... Right? If we saw him on the ground, we'd be like, oh my goodness, are you okay? And like try to help him up or call someone to help or call 911 or whatever we thought we needed to do. We're, we're probably not going to pass this guy by, especially if it's our friend. So we think about our brothers and sisters that are weak or falling away spiritually. We need to reach out to those people and help them out. We need to help these people to get back up spiritually. I'm going to confess to you personally, sometimes I'm losing patience in helping people. So I need, first of all, you need to pray for me. Because I know that I'm not always as strong as I need to be. I know the fact that I didn't want to study with these people that I know needed it. Man, that's on me. That's a spiritual weakness I have. That I have to be strengthened through the word of God. Through the encouragement like it's saying here of other brothers and sisters. You know, telling me, hey, I'm praying for you. God can help you through this. You're doing a good work if you're doing the will of the Lord. We need to encourage each other. Even people that might look strong, they might be weak, right? So we have to go out of our way to strengthen and to be patient, to realize we're all in this together. It's this collective work for God. There's a verse in uh, Acts 20 and 35 where Jesus is uh, giving encouragement. Let's finish there in Acts 20 and 35. This is a, a verse that I used to think about just focused on the words of Jesus, but the whole thing is very relevant to what we are focused on here. So Paul is talking about the work that he was doing to help the church in Ephesus. So he says, In everything, I show you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. So it takes some hard work sometimes to help the weak. I mean, sometimes, man, wouldn't it be easy if everyone just had all their ducks in a row? You didn't have to do much for anybody. But we know life isn't like that. We know that there's people that are falling down. We know there's people that may want someone to help them up. They just are faint harder. They're just whatever. There's people that are unruly. They're not intending to go off in the path. But like we talked about in the last couple lessons, Satan's got it in their heart and their mind to put them on the wrong path. And so we need to, when we see these people that are going astray, we need to reel them back in. It says to help the weak. Because anyone that's not strong in the Lord is spiritually weak or spiritually asleep, as we talked about. So we want to be people that help the weak. And remember, it is more blessed to give than to receive. 
Sometimes when I'm feeling sorry for myself, I'll think of, well, I'm trying to help people and people will try to help me now. I'm just thinking for myself. Okay. But I don't need to do that. You're more blessed to give than to receive. And the times that I go out to give, I usually end out receiving as well. So we shouldn't think that this whole life we're just going to give, give, give. Especially if we're with Christians that are strong. We don't have to do this, and I'm preaching myself again, strengthening of the weak on our own. We shouldn't feel alone. We should be more than willing to bring a brother or sister out. And I'm happy if you want me to come with you to visit somebody that you know is spiritually weak. We need to be people that realize that we're all this together. That we're all there to strengthen each other. There was this movie we were watching where this guy, he was like an older guy and, you know, he's, he was actually someone that was very strong, so to speak, in what he was trying to do to help righteousness prevail. But he actually just pretended to be weak physically in order that people would be more sympathetic to his cause. So no matter how weak we might be physically, we can be strong spiritually. We don't have to let the ailments of this world, the things that are tugging at our hearts or at our bodies, to stop us from being all that God wants us to be. We can be people that even if we have the strength physically that we want, spiritual strength is all that really counts, in the end especially. So we want to be people that are like that. We can and should pray for any thorn in the flesh to be taken aside, but really we need to help be strong ourselves in the strength of the weak and realize that God is going to give to us immeasurably if we do that. So continue to grow stronger in your faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We can gain strength on our own just reading the Bible and being encouraged and strengthened by it. When we have sin in our life, it can and will weaken us. So we've got to put it out of the way. We're never going to be able to help someone if we're like that guy on the ground. We're not able to help someone back up. We need to be able to be there for people. We need to confess the name of Christ, which is going to help lead them to salvation. Of course, we have to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Our sins are washed away. We walk in a newness of life. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's even a passage in Romans chapter 8 that says, We don't even know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit prays for us. Isn't that awesome? The Bible also says that Jesus is praying for us, the Spirit's praying for us. We've got a lot helping us in this life. We don't need to feel weak or to stay weak. We need to be strong and we need to help others because if we are all strong together, this world's going to be a whole lot better place to be in, to live through, and to enjoy. So let us be strong, and if you need help with your spiritual strength, if you need help with your salvation, you can come forward as we stand and sing.